Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a fascinating one on the book of Daniel. We're ready for number 10, lesson number 10 in this series for March 7 of 2020. And this lesson is entitled, From Confession to Consultation. Hmm, I wonder what that could mean. Well, the main emphasis here will be Daniel 9. So if you have your Bible open, you'll be able to get many of our verses if you go to that particular chapter. But as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, it's such a privilege to try to follow your footsteps through Scripture, to see what you've said to your children down through the generations and through the ages. And now as we think once again about the thoughts that you gave to Daniel and try to think of Daniel's thoughts as he responded to you. May we be blessed, as I'm sure we will be. May all those who listen in also learn something more about your way of communicating and your kind of love for us as human beings, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Daniel 9 is an incredible prayer and a response to that prayer. It's a prayer from Daniel, and it's one of the most wonderful prayers in the entire Bible. The whole chapter is taken up by that prayer plus the response. Daniel was praying because he had studied the prophecies found in Jeremiah 25, verses 11 and 12, and Jeremiah 29, verse 10, in which God had told Jeremiah that the time of exile in Babylon would be 70 years. Daniel recognized that that time period was about to come to an end. Ten years earlier, Daniel had been given the message we now find in Daniel 8 regarding the ram and the he-goat. At the end of that prophecy, Daniel was told it will continue for 2,300 evenings and mornings during which sacrifices will not be offered. Then the temple will be restored. Daniel 8, 14, that's from the Good News Bible. At the time, it made Daniel sick because he could not understand it. I mean, I want you to think about this. Um, 70 years, he's praying, okay, Lord, tell us, are we, are we, aren't we close to this time? Isn't it about time for this 70-year prophecy to be done? And God says, well, there's still going to be 2,300 days or years using the prophetic table and during that time, no, no sacrifices will be offered. And what do you suppose that meant to Daniel? Because the temple wouldn't be restored that. Temple wouldn't be restored. It wouldn't be working again. And boy, he just, I mean, he must have just, oh, you know, when, that, when he heard that. Well, it made him sick. But Daniel was still studying the scriptures available to him to try to determine what the prophecy meant. Ten years later, he's still trying to struggle. I don't, he, do you think he wrote it down and rehearsed it? Because, I mean, obviously he got this as a message from God. He didn't, wasn't delivered on a papyrus. What do you suppose happened here? Anybody got any insights into what you think happened? I, I, I suspect he probably had written it down in some form or another. Yeah, and I, then he reviewed it as he, trying to figure out, okay, what did God mean here? Was that in Aramaic or Hebrew? That this is in Hebrew. Hebrew. But I think my understanding it says evening morning or is it evening mornings? It did, but in in the English they say well evenings and mornings. Mm -hmm. But it does. It's, a, it's it, the same it, as Genesis one. Yeah. Whatever. Well, okay, I Dennis. Have a, I have a question though. I, the Good News Bible inserts uh, which sacrifices will not be offered. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there, because some people who want Antiochus Epiphanes to be yeah. the, the result of this interpret evenings and mornings as evening and morning sacrifice, mm -hmm. which doesn't make sense because anywhere else in Scripture it's always morning and evening sacrifices because they're only nine or six, six hours apart. And the uh, after evening sacrifice is uh, finished with seven trumpets. So 
the idea of evenings and mornings uh, would be strange in terms of sacrifice. So that, yeah. but that seems to be inserted there because that's their understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, in the New American Standard, it doesn't have that at all. About the sacrifices. Right. Okay. That that could be. We're going to find out that there's several places in in Daniel nine, as in some of these other chapters here, where very slight differences in the Hebrew lead to very different translations depending on your mindset. Right. Also, so, the Septuagint has both. It has unto twenty uh, twenty three hundred days, evening and morning. Then shall, shall the sanctuary be restored. So. I think they probably were trying to clarify that for the Greek understanding that would not have maybe picked on up on the idea that evening and morning was uh, hearkening back to the idea of, the, of creation or the use of the term in creation. Okay, well, you want to take us to Daniel 9, 1 and 2? Septuagint says, uh, I think in Brenton's, uh, says uh, 2,400 days. Well. And there's apparently a uh, Latin edition that says 2,200. So. Yeah, Where is it? But those aren't the major yeah. ones. But they, uh, but they all, uh, I haven't seen the 22, but the 24 also says days, evening, and morning. So they, uh, there, there seems, it seems to have been the original att uh, attempt because there are other translations and they all have it. They all have the... Yeah, days, the Old evening. Greek and the Theodosian and, mm -hmm. and the various... English translations. I don't read Greek, so yeah. <laughs> I have to rely Yeah, well, on. yeah. Um, there are three different versions, of, as you know, of, of the in, in Greek of Daniel. And, and I don't know if there's more than one version in Hebrew, but um, it, it can get real tricky. <laughs> yeah, the different ones have different uh, texts. Anyway, uh, Daniel 9, 1 and 2. Uh, uh, Darius the Mede, who was the son of Xerxes, ruled over the kingdom of Babylonia. In the first year of his reign, I was studying the sacred books and thinking about the 70 years that, da that Jerusalem would be in ruins, according to what the Lord had told the prophet Jeremiah. Okay. Good news Bible. What's the relationship between the days of Jeremiah and the days of, Jan of Daniel? Kind of contemporaneous, aren't they? They are contemporaneous. Jeremiah was a little bit ahead of Daniel, but pretty close to contemporary. And he's already calling the writings of Jeremiah inspired. Hmm. What the Lord had told the prophet Jeremiah, that by definition means inspired. Yeah. That's very interesting. Well, by a careful study of the chronology, we can determine that this prayer was offered in 539 B.C., the very year that the Medo-Persian Empire replaced Babylon. Daniel felt certain that something very important for the Jewish people was about to happen. But he also recognized that the sins of God's people were continuing to pile up. And you can read about that in Leviticus 26. There's also a chapter in De De Deuteronomy 30 where God just very specifically spelled out what would happen if they didn't obey him. And we don't have time to read it right now, but those are the verses you can look at. And they clearly had violated God's directions. So now the question is, did Daniel have access to many of the Old Testament scrolls? I mean, imagine if your Bible consisted of a whole pile as big as this table of scrolls. Well, he you probably had the Torah. Yeah, well, he could have. That's a possibility. But now we're talking about he's reading Jeremiah. Yeah. And Jeremiah never got to Babylon. He was over in Jerusalem, and then he was later forced to go down to Egypt. And some of his book was written down in Egypt. Did Who communicated that material from Egypt to Babylon or Susa or wherever Daniel was. I mean, that's a Made of long ways. Male, yeah. <laughs> point male, express. male people. Yeah. Send, send him an e well, there, there, no, there wasn't there any. There must have been couriers that kept the kingdom in touch yeah. with one another. But there wasn't any regular mail service. No. The first regular, sort of regular mail service was in the Roman period. Yeah. So, wow. 
Anyway, they, they knew of in, they knew of Jeremiah, and they uh, even offered to have him come to Babylon and stay there because there was all yeah. this turmoil in Jerusalem. Well, as a young student in Jerusalem, it is very likely that Daniel carefully studied the book of Leviticus. Of course, that would be part of the Torah. Mm -hmm. Had he memorized it? Yep. Possible. How carefully are we studying God's word in order to understand what the implications are for our time? Well, look at Daniel 9, starting from 3 to, I'm going to read a few verses. And I prayed earnestly to the Lord God, pleading with him, fasting, wearing sackcloth, and sitting in ashes. I wonder what the people he worked for, or the people he, who worked under him, thought of him doing this stuff. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed the sins of my people. I said, Lord God, you're great. We honor you. You're faithful to your covenant and show constant love to those who love you and do what you command, which, of course, wouldn't include the Jewish people he's talking about right now. This is an incredible prayer of intercession. Daniel recognized how sinful his people had been, and he included himself among the sinners. But he also recognized that God's name was being mocked because of the condition of his people. Most of all, Daniel wanted God's reputation to be defended. Wow. Daniel was not asking for an explanation of his people's sins. He was fully aware of them. He was still trying to understand the details of the prophecy in Daniel 8. He recognized that only God could answer the questions that he had. And he appealed to God's grace. Martin? And that is found in Daniel 9, 17 to 19. O oh God, hear my prayer and pleading. Restore your temple, which has been destroyed. Restore it so that everyone will know that you are God. Listen to us, God. Look at us and see the trouble we are in and the suffering of the city that bears your name. We are praying to you because you are merciful, not because we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. This is from the Good News yeah. Bible. That's amazing. Think about him. He's just pleading with God for God to do something on God's behalf. He keeps, Daniel keeps saying, your people, yeah. God, yeah. Your, your temple, city, your, your city. city. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, how many of us are praying for God's reputation? Well, Daniel was not the only one who appealed for something to be done to protect God's reputation. Think about the story of Elijah. He was apparently praying for God, and he not only prayed for it, he did something. Mm -hmm. Remember, he called those 850 prophets of Baal and Asher up to the Mount, Mount Carmel and did them in. Yeah. Is there any record, though, where God says, well hacked or well hewn? Or, <laughs> well done. It's just, it's just a story there, see. Yeah. Well, God did send the fire to yeah. get Elijah's well, sacrifice, but that we was think after it, that that he killed the 850 prophets. Yeah, we think that, uh, that, that God sent it. it does, does it say that God sent it or yeah. just fire came down from heaven? There's lightning comes down like fire from heaven. So it, it is God actually doing yeah, well, it? What a coincidence. It begins our, our paradigm, our point of view, see? Just because something happened doesn't necessarily mean God did it. Yeah, but it, it was obviously at the point of the evening sacrifice in response to Elijah's prayer. That's pretty suspicious. I'm not saying it's not true. It's just uh, I'm yeah. raising the question. It, yeah. it, it is. And God's reputation was resoundingly upheld. Look also at the prayer of Hezekiah. When Jerusalem was surrounded by the Assyrian army, that's in Isaiah 37, 16 to 20. And God, again, the Assyrians were making fun, mocking God, saying, Who's, isn't it you, your God's not going to be able to protect you. Look at all these other cities. We, and God says, okay, you want to know? Let's, let's see. Well, we do not have recorded in the scripture either in the book of Daniel or any other references to him that Daniel committed any sins. Of course, we know that he was a sinner like the rest of us, but Daniel did not hold himself aloof from his people. He continually referred to himself along with the Jewish people as having done wrong, and that's Daniel 9, 5 to 14 is the whole section. There are other incredibly important prayers that follow the same pattern in many respects. See the prayers of Moses recorded in Exodus 32, 7 to 14 and Numbers 14, 
10 to 25, twice God speaks and acts as if he's going to wipe out the whole Jewish nation. And Moses says, you couldn't do that. Think of what the Egyptians would say. Mm -hmm. Think of what, in other words, you have to do something for your reputation's sake. Are there reasons why we should be praying similar prayers in our day? James 5, 16, remember, James is probably the brother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So then, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you will be healed. The prayer of a good person has a powerful effect. Okay, if we had a bunch of people, good people praying together, could we bring the second coming sooner? Well, we have a bunch of good people praying for that, and it hasn't happened yet. Well, don't you wish we could have access to all of Daniel's prayers over the previous 10 years? Surely this prayer was not the first time he had prayed about that subject. Furthermore, it is very unlikely that the entire prayer is recorded. There's probably quite a bit more of it that we don't have. And if he prayed three times a day, there's a lot of prayer there a lot to of get prayer. recorded. Exactly. We can be reasonably certain that in his three times a day, praying with his windows open toward Jerusalem, Daniel had developed a very close relationship with God. We should say amen to that, right? Daniel's intercession for his people was in some ways like the intercession offered by Christ himself. But there was one significant difference. Christ was God, and he never sinned. And there's Hebrews 4, 15, and 7, 26, and 27 to support that. Nevertheless, as we know, Jesus identified himself with our sins. And look at Hebrews 7, 26, and 27. Jesus, then, is the high priest that meets our needs. He is holy. He has no fault or sin in him. He has been set apart from sinners and raised above the heavens. He is not like other high priests. He does not need to offer sacrifices every day for his own sins first and then for the sins of people. He offered one sacrifice once and for all when he offered himself. That's from the Good News Bible. And then Ellen White comments from Faith and Works. If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man, <coughs> and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting a part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition would be rejected as treason. Wow. So we uh, have, treason, what is we treason We have no mean? merit. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that, that would fits be. fits the 1888 message. Yeah, that would be. That's his righteousness. Yeah, mm -hmm. trying to earn your way. Yeah. Well, treason means you're trying to overthrow the government. That's what Satan's trying to do. What do these words teach us about our need for an intercessor? So, coming now to a little more details, this, this gets very detailed. What work was to be done within the 70-week period? Why can only Jesus accomplish it? You've got a fairly lengthy p section there, Myra. Yeah. Daniel 9, 21 to 27. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly, fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. He and he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. I'd like some of that. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Can I interrupt for a second? There are people who have looked at this and said, okay, how long would it take you to read this prayer? And they calculate, okay, you travel from, from Orion to here, and they estimate two and a half minutes, I think it was, or something like that. And how fast would you have to go, which is completely ridiculous, because there's no way that this is his whole prayer, first of all. So he was praying for much longer than two and a half minutes. Uh, but even if it was two and a half hours. Even, even if it's two and a half hours, right. Okay. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the trans transgression and to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for inequity, 
to bring the in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the be from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times, and after the sixty-two weeks Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. It's a new King James Version. So obviously it's perfectly clear what all that meant, right? No. <laughs> yeah, you, you almost have to understand Hebrew to really sort of figure out what's going on here. So we'll, we'll work on it. The language used in these verses may be confusing to us, but there are six very important things mentioned in these verses, particularly in verse 24. To finish the transgression, the Hebrew word for transgression, pesha, suggests the will for violations by an inferior against a superior. For example, Proverbs 28, 24. In which it's talking about parents, I mean children versus their parents. This word also occurs in the Bible with regard to open defiance of God by humans, Ezekiel 2, verse 3. Through the blood of Jesus, however, rebellion against God is, squ is quashed, and humans are offered the merits that flow from Calvary. Sounds a bit yeah. legalistic. Yes. Um, not very clear speech. No. Okay, go ahead. And number two, to make an end of sins. The verb carries the meaning of to seal, and here to, it means that sin is forgiven. Since the fall, the human race has been unable to live up to God's standards, but the Messiah will take care of our failures. Number three, to make reconciliation for impurity. As Paul iniquity. Oh, excuse me, iniquity, I'm sorry. Well, it's not a whole lot different, is it? No. <laughs> As Paul says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Here, too, only Jesus can bring about this reality. Okay, Gary? Yes. Let me go back here. Uh, uh, it says here, to please the, all the, the fullness should dwell. But that is, that Jesus being fully God as far as, isn't that what the yeah. way we generally understand yeah. it? Yeah. It means that one who came here to this earth was fully God. He wasn't somebody else. He was fully God. Well, when Jesus says, you've seen me, the, yeah. you've seen the Father, exactly. it was, it was he pl playing a trick with words on it? Yeah. He said, you've, you've seen it. And then what is it, Isaiah 9? Yeah. And also known as... Uh, well, in, in, in John chapter 8, when he's talking to scribes and Pharisees and the, whoever there at the Sanhedrin, three times he said, once he says, he says, I am, and they didn't catch it. And a little while later he says, I am, the great name of God, and they didn't catch it. And finally he says... Before Abraham was, I am. Damn. Oh, <laughs> see, you are claiming to be God. Yeah. Go ahead, Gary. All right, number four, quote, to bring in everlasting righteousness, unquote. Christ took our place on the cross and thereby bestowed upon us the blessed condition of being right with God. Only by faith can we receive this righteousness that comes from God. Number five, quote, to seal up vision and prophecy, unquote. When Christ offered himself in sacrifice, the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to his atoning work were sealed up in the sense that they were fulfilled. Number six, quote, and to anoint the most holy, unquote. 
The most holy mentioned here is not a person but a place. So the statement refers to the anointing of the heavenly sanctuary as Christ was inaugurated there as our great high priest. It comes from Hebrews 8.1 and the Adult Sabbath School Study Bible Guide for Wednesday, March 4. Okay. Why do you think God gave Daniel that confusing message in Daniel 8 and waited 10 years to give Daniel the key information to understand it? What, what, what would be the purpose of that? I mean, God could have waited if you say, well, he, he, you know, Daniel 9 couldn't be given until the right time. Then why did he put Daniel 8 10 years earlier. He could have waited until maybe one year earlier or one month earlier or one week earlier. Was Daniel considering this for that 10 years and figuring out in his mind what he thought it might be and some of the possibilities and waiting for God to give him the correct answer, mm -hmm. to help him understand the correct answer? Well, one thing is that the, uh, that part of his first vision, Daniel 2, had already started being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. If he'd given it during the time of uh, when Babylon was still in power, there's a little difference in, in perspective. But here now, he has seen the change from mm -hmm. the gold to the silver. Exactly. And uh, so he... Medo-Persia has replaced Babylon. Right. So... Um, and he's also seeing that, that it's almost time, the 70 years is almost up. So instead yeah. of celebrating as contemporary people might do, oh, it's going to come. Yeah. You know, it's just party. Uh, he prays, he fasts, he prays. He doesn't assume that it's just going to happen just because. Yeah. So. Well. I hope I don't need to tell any of you out there that this is a very important passage to Seventh-day Adventists. We began to see the importance of it after the careful study of William Miller in the 1820s and 1830s, during which time he determined that the 70-week prophecy was linked to the 2300-year prophecy by being cut off from it. You remember how he got to that place, how William Miller got to that place? what his little project was. He started out with Genesis 1-1. And he said, I'm not going to, I'm going to read a verse and I'm not going to move on to the next verse until I'm quite sure I understand what that verse means. And he had his Bible and he had an old Cruden's Concordance. And if he found a word he didn't understand, he's looking up in the Concordance, back and forth, back and forth. And he's, he did this for years. Well, something can only be cut off from either the beginning or the end of something else. So Daniel was told that, according to the biblical text, the 70 weeks are determined or cut off. This indicates that the time period of 490 years has been cut from a larger time period. That is, from the 2300 years designated, and that's the only longer time period it could possibly be, as the 2300 years, designated in the vision of chapter 8. It follows from this that the 2300 years and the 490 years must have the same starting point, namely 457 B.C. And how do we arrive at that 457? Do you mm -hmm. remember? Our, that <coughs> was when the degree from Artaxerxes came. Yes, and we can nail that down because we can nail down the time periods of those, uh, the emperors of Medo-Persia down to within a day or two in many cases. Um, I won't go into all the technical details. You can look at it up, look it up in the SDA Bible Commentary if you're interested in all of that, working that detail out. Well, having been confused and fe having felt sick for ten years, how do you think Daniel felt as he's beginning to see what that prophecy meant? Or was this prophecy one of those that was sealed up so Daniel never did figure it out? Well, the 70-week prophecy is divided into three sections, a seven-week section, a 62-week section, and then the very important 70th week. What do we know about those periods? This is also from the Bible, Adult Bible School uh, Study uh, Guide for Thursday. Um, the seven 
weeks, 49 years, most likely refer to the time during which Jerusalem will be built, rebuilt. After these seven weeks, there will be 42 weeks, two, uh, 400, 62. or 62 weeks, uh, or 434 years, uh, leading to Messiah the Prince, uh, Daniel 9.25. Thus, 483 years after Artaxerxes' decree, that is in the year A.D. 27, the Jesus the Messiah is baptized and anointed by the Holy Spirit for his messianic mission. And if you've had an opportunity to really try to figure out these dates, it's amazing that there's, you can look through Roman history, you can look through Greek history, you look at Medo-Persian history, and it's possible to line out. I mean, there are literally dates carved in stone in Greece that verify the datings, these datings we have worked out. It's amazing. And uh, some in Delphi, some in Corinth, where things that, you know, there they are, carved in stone. It said, okay, and based on Paul's thing, and it, it, it confirms Paul's thing, and then Paul talks about things, and it, it confirms the dating. So, you know, God, he's not just, you know, just blatantly telling us, but he's saying, if you do your homework, you can nail these things down. It's pretty amazing. Margaret? No, I no, no. I'm sorry. With this. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Daniel 9.25, and this is Good News Bible. Note this and understand it. From the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until God's chosen leader comes, seven times seven years will pass. Uh, Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses and will stand for uh, seven times 62 years. But this will be a, a time of troubles. And then from the Bible study guide on Thursday, during the 70th week, other crucial events will take place. Messiah shall be cut off, uh, verse 26, which refers to the death of Christ. Two, uh, the Messiah shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, verse 27. This is the special mission of Jesus and the apostles to the Jewish nation. Let's interrupt for there for just a second. The Messiah shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. What, what was the time period we're talking about here? What was the beginning of it? What was the middle of it? What was the end of it? Just so we all are together on what we're talking about here. The beginning was the beginning of Jesus' ministry at his baptism. His baptism, right. The middle? His crucifixion. His crucifixion. The end? Stoning, stoning of Stephen. Stephen. Yeah. Okay, so it's not just the stoning of Stephen. The, uh, Why is that? Paul's conversion. Yeah, Paul's conversion? No, uh, a little after that. Mm -hmm. But what's the real event that happened? Daniel 8, verse I mean, Daniel. Acts 8, verse 1. Do you remember what it says? The gospel is no longer going exclusively to the Jews. That's an interpretation. I agree with that, but that's an interpretation. Look at, look at Acts we, we, we often don't emphasize, I think, what is really the most important part of that verse. Verse da Daniel, I mean, I keep wanting to say Daniel. Acts 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of his murder. We know about that. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. And what was the result? All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. Some of them devout men and so forth. Very so what what really happened? God finally said, okay, he had told them, spread the gospel, go first to Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria. the uttermost parts of the world. Samaria and then the other. Samaria and the other, yeah, correct. So it has now been how many years after the death of Christ? Three and a half. half. Three and a half years. Where are they concentrating their work? Jerusalem. They're still focused all in Jerusalem. And God, I think, just sim simply says it's time to get beyond Jerusalem. And persecution was the way he did it. Is that analogous to we need to get further than the walls of, of Loma Linda and Southern California and <laughs> even the United yeah, States? Yeah, that's what it's analogous to, yes. Okay. So we have these three pages. And by the way, that AD 27 date can be nailed down because uh, based on the the dating of the Roman emperors, yeah, Augustus. Luke, Luke says when it was. He, no, that's the birth. You're talking about the birth. I'm oh. talking about AD 27. 
mm. the baptism. Yeah. And he was 30 at that time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But there's, I, obviously we don't have time to go into all those details, but yeah. it can be nailed down. It's amazing how that all fits together. Okay. Dennis, you're going to... Oh, that's up? right. Uh, I was looking something up. Um, and I am, where am I? Number three. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Uh, in verse 27, three and a half years after his baptism, that is in the middle of the week, Jesus brings the sacrificial system to an end and in the sense that it no longer has any more prophetic significance by offering himself as the final and perfect sacrifice of the new covenant, thus avoiding the need for any more animal sacrifices. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. Do you believe that at that point, when Jesus died, and that temple curtain was ripped from top to bottom, he meant that from that day forward, not a single ac animal sacrifice was recognized as being of any value? I think so. Yeah. Were I, the animal sacrifices of any real value before that? Well, now you didn't need to ask that question. question. <laughs> I agree with that. They were told to do it. They were. They were to teach a lesson. Yes. Did they understand why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, did they understand? That's yeah. the real question. Did God want the blood to flow through the streets of Jerusalem? Yeah. Well, there's a book called uh, Jerusalem in the Time of Jesus by a fellow by the name of Joaquin Jeremias. And he says there was uh, at the time of the sacrifices, there was a, almost like a river or a stream of blood flowing out of the temple down into the Kidron Valley. Yeah. And it was just, well, if you're talking about sacrificing thousands of animals yeah. yeah and jesus never explained what the efficacy of his death was going to be well it's not recorded at least well <laughs> so we, we, we build an awful lot of theology based yeah. on what we see and we yeah. read it with a certain uh, paradigm exactly. so just because it's no, I, I'm, I'm with you i'm just saying that yeah and arguing what is it, is it arguing from silence or something how, yeah. how does that go argument of silence okay we're interrupting All right. a lot here Dennis. last but I kept my finger Good. <laughs> this time. The last week of the 70-week prophecy ends in AD 34 when Stephen is martyred and the gospel mission begins to reach not only the Jews but the Gentiles as well because intense okay, and, persecution and started in around there. actually a period there because that's where the quotation ends. Yeah. I added what comes next. Because intense persecution started in and around Jerusalem. However, the message did not really begin to spread to the Gentiles until some time later. Yeah, three well, chapters they went later. to Samaria. Well, the when those, those unnamed missionaries went from Libya and Cyprus to Antioch and said, we're not going to limit our preaching to Jews. We're going to, we're going to preach to Gentiles, and boom. And then, of course, that led to the Paul and Barnabas and then Paul and Silas thing and the, it still took a long time before the church recognized yeah. that it was okay time. to preach to the Gentiles, yep. that they might possibly be saved. Well, as far as we know, William Miller, one of the main movers of the Advent movement in the early 1800s, was the first one to work out the details of the 2300-year day prophecy. From 457 B.C. down to 34 A.D. is a period of 490 years, or 70 weeks, 490 days, and that's assuming, remember, that in those days they, they counted using the Roman numeral system. And the Roman numeral system, there is no zero. So you can't have a zero year. So you count down to 1 B.C. and then you go to 1 A.D. So you have to account for that extra day. So you go from 430, 457 B.C. down to 34 A.D. And that's the 490 years. And uh, then, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, on Wikipedia, there, if you look under the 2300-year yes. day, uh, there's a host of people who have uh, attempted through the years to interpret that. They come up with different starting and ending dates, and yeah. uh, there's a whole different uh, thing. Uh, the Baha'i Faith also ends it in 1844, because that's uh -huh. when they started. Yeah. So, uh, but there, uh, he, he was probably the only one that, uh, reckoned it according to uh, he was the only one Christianity. That, yeah, it spelled it out. Of course, then if you subtract 490 from 
2300, what do you get? 1810. And so you add 1810 to 34, and what did you get? 1844. 1844. And part of the reason why our friends, our Christian friends, don't want to interpret this very carefully using these methods is if you say something is going to happen in 1844, then you have to agree with who? You Seventh have to agree Ad? that there actually mm -hmm. can be prophecy. Yes. That yeah. God could know the future. Not only that, you have to agree with Seventh day Adventists. <laughs> we wouldn't want to do that. Well, Seventh-day Adventists are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. That's part of our name, Adventist. But we do not have a 70-year prophecy like Daniel had to determine when that event will happen. Don't you wish we had a 70-year prophecy? Mm -hmm. We have often boastfully claimed that we have the truth. Do we feel superior to others for this reason? Would Jesus have something to say to us as he did to Simon at his feast as recorded in Luke 7, 40-47? I'm going to take, I think we got a moment. Let, I'm just going to read those verses. Remember, Simon had invited him to this feast. And why was Simon celebrating Jesus at this time? He had been a leper and had been healed by Jesus. Exactly. So he was, and he was a? Pharisee. Pharisee. And so, he was a relative of Lazarus. Yes. And Lazarus had, been re had rose from the dead. Had risen from the dead. Had been raised from the dead. Well, here they are at this Thing, and Mary comes in and she does what? She breaks this very expensive bottle of ointment, spreads it on his head, spreads it on his feet, wipes it with her hair, and it's filling the, the fragrance is filling the whole room. And Simon starts to criticize her. And Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Yes, teacher, he said, tell me. I mean, this is, you know, he's, this is his banquet. He's showing how wonderful he is by putting a banquet on for Jesus. There were two men who owed money to a money lender, Jesus began. One owed him 500 silver coins and the other owed him 50. Neither of them could pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Which one then would love him more? I suppose, answered Simon, I, I, you wonder if he began to suspect that there was some, <laughs> some trick to this question, that it would be the one who was forgiven, him, forgiven more. You're right, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your home and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You did not welcome me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. You provided no olive oil for my head, but she has covered my feet with perfume. I tell you then, the great love she has, grown, has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven, but whoever has been, give, been forgiven little shows only a little love. Wow. And there's more to the story. What's so amazing in that story is the fact that Mary was Simon's niece, and he had led Mary into sin. Mary's life of sin probably began with that incest, which led her all the way to demon possession. And you can read the whole sequence in Desire of Ages, 558 to 563. But, and here's the, the clincher that, that's incredible. Margaret? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Christ might have extinguished every spark of hope in Mary's soul, but he did not. The heart searcher read the motives that led to her actions, and he also saw the spirit that prompted Simon's words. Seest thou this woman? He said to him, She's a sinner. I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little... But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Wow. Those present thinking of Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead by Christ, and who was at this time a guest at his uncle's house, began to question, saying, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? But Christ continued, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. This is from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, May 9, 1900. So she says right there that Mary, who was the sister of Lazarus, was in her uncle's house when all this took place. And of course, that was Simon. Mm -hmm. So this is a case of incest. The reading of Scripture was central to Daniel's prayer and his hope. 
Because of his trust in God, he was sure that the Jewish people would soon be rescued from their exile. Daniel's importunate prayers to God led to the information we have in this chapter, which is so important to Seventh-day Adventists. If we were praying in the same way as Daniel was, would God reveal future things to us? Hmm. Are we coming boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need? Hebrews 4.16. Daniel waited 10 years for an answer to his questions. The Hebrew of this passage makes it very clear that he was particularly concerned about the 2300 evenings and mornings. Daniel was getting elderly. Nearly 70 years had passed since he had been taken into Babylonian captivity. More than 70 years, actually. Now, he was pleading with God not only for an answer to his prayers, but also for something to be done for Jerusalem and Judea. We can be quite sure that Daniel was aware not only of the passage in Leviticus 26, 40-44, but also of the blessings and curses recorded in Deuteronomy 30. So it was all spelled out there, already in prophecy in the days of Moses. This prayer obviously focused on the condition of God's people in exile in Daniel's day. With how many of his fellow Hebrews did Daniel have an opportunity to interact? Did you think he ever had an opportunity we could get away from his responsibilities of government and meet with his fellow... His three friends. His three friends, even? Yeah. There must have been... I mean, there were many, many others in somewhere around in Babylonia, many, thousands of them. Did he ever meet with any of them? We just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Even more important, <laughs> what are we praying for, doing, and witnessing about to vindicate God's character? The great controversy cannot come to an end until these issues are resolved. And that's a really important point I wish you out there would think about. It's easy for us to think, well, why doesn't God just wind things up? No, God can't wind things up. He can't bring this whole thing to a conclusion until the issues in the great controversy are fully verified, confirmed, whatever you want to call it. Let us review the very important aspects of what we have studied. I have omitted the first section of this because, because it is not directly related to our question. So let's look at those important sections. Jim? This prophecy is given within, within a chronological framework of 70 weeks, or 490 years, which is tantamount to seven jubilees. Ten jubilees. Tantamount? Ten jubilees. to ten jubilees. You, you said ten seven. jubilees, ten times forty-nine. Mm -hmm. The emphasis on the number seven may indicate the perfect salvation to be accomplished through the Messiah. <clears throat> Moreover, <clears throat> this prophetic timetable indicates that God knows the future and acts within time, space to carry out His saving plan. Okay, so. Um, this is getting into some fairly detailed uh, interpretation of these things, but that's all right. I don't, I don't think that's a problem. Um, let's, let's go ahead and move on, see some more details. Gordon? Third, Gabriel comes <clears throat> to Daniel, quote, understand the vision. Come to make Daniel, quote, understand the vision, as in Daniel 9.23. The verb understands points back to Daniel 8, which concluded with Daniel's not understanding the vision. The word vision is the same Hebrew word employed to designate the appearance of the two angelic beings and the cleansing of the sanctuary after 2300 evenings and mornings. Okay, now let's, let's be very clear about this. There are two words that, re that talk about visions or... or um, dreams. Dreams in, in, in Daniel 8. And in Daniel 9, it refers specifically to this one talking about the, the, the word he uses is not the other one, but the word that spe specifically talks about the 2300 evenings and mornings. So, I mean, this is subtle. I mean, you got to, you can't always pick this up in an English translation, but if you, if you know a little bit about the Hebrew, there's that linkage clearly. Okay, Myra? If the 
70 weeks, 490. Fourth. Oh, fourth. Oh, sorry. I was looking at the next one. Fourth. Fourth, the prophecy of Daniel 9 provides a crucial piece of information to the understanding to understand the beginning of the 2300 evenings and mornings and therefore ascertain its end. According to Gabriel, 70 weeks were are determined. This Hebrew verb means cut, which implies that the 70 weeks are cut or severed from a longer period. So both the prophecies have the same starting point, which is the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel 9.25. This command refers to the decree of Artaxerxes in 457 BC, authorizing the Jews to return to their homeland and rebuild Jerusalem, Ezra 7. Okay, now there's two or three things that are critical there to our understanding of this passage. One, is it valid to say if something is cut? Is it valid to say, well, you can't cut it off, cut it off from anywhere else except either the beginning or the end? Is that a valid conclusion? Because that's the whole point that we make here. You can't cut it out of the middle. It belongs somewhere. Yeah, it belongs somewhere. It belongs to something that yes. was cut off. And of course, if you, if you can't nail that down, then the 2300 days, you can't, you can't fit it anywhere. You don't, there's nothing, it doesn't fit anything that anybody's thought of. There, there, there are some people who have tried to say it's 1150 evenings and 1150 mornings, and therefore that's about three years and a little bit more, and that must be the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, which is about three years. But obviously this is just complete, I mean, just, jumping here and there and sort of trying to figure out what fits together. But if you, if you follow it and you, you allow God to be able to predict the future and you say, yes, this is cut off, therefore it must be cut off from the beginning, then that identifies uh, us, gives us that the two prophecies must have begun together at the same time. Okay, and how do we arrive at the 457? Well, you go back to Ezra 7 and you look carefully and you see that of the four prophecies that were given for people to return, there was the first one. Four to, commands. Four commands. Or decrees, yeah, decrees. thank you. Four commands or four commands or decrees. The first one was Cyrus, um, and then um, Darius for the rebuilding of the temple. Then Ezra in 457 B.C. and then finally Nehemiah in 444 B.C. And Nehemiah, of course, was the one who finally had the impetus because he was a governor to accomplish what Ezra had been sent to do. And so we come up with the whole story as we understand it. And it's, that's logical, but we, we have to, we've got those two or three small points that we need to nail down to make sure that the whole thing fits. Jim? Fifth, the 70 weeks, that is 490 years, started in 457 B.C., and ended in 34 AD 34. The events that would take place during the last week took place as predicted. At the beginning of the week, Jesus the Messiah made his public appearance being baptized by John the Baptist in AD 27. In the middle of the week, Jesus was crucified, AD 31, and at the end of the week and of the 490 years, the martyrdom of Stephen propelled the gospel message to be taken to the Gentiles. Okay. Any questions that jump up in your mind there about that, that particular sequence? It's very important. So we have that seven-year period from the baptism of Christ to the, to the killing of the stoning of Stephen, and that, therefore that began period of intense persecution against Christians. That's the seven-year period. Okay, Carrie? The sixth one. Another crucial event that would occur during the seventh week was the anoint, anointing rather, of the Most Holy, which refers to the inauguration of the heavenly sanctuary when Christ ascended to heaven in A.D. 31 and commenced his intercessory ministry there. 
this sanctuary must be the heavenly one because the Jerusalem temple had ceased to have saving relevance in A.D. 31 when Jesus' death made the sacrificial system no longer effective. Okay, let me interrupt there for a second. What are we trying to say here? We're trying to say here that we're now talking about something that didn't happen here on this earth. It happened in heaven. How do we, how do we, what, how do we nail that down? How do we confirm that? It's pretty distinctly Seventh-day Adventist, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're yeah. getting this all from the <clears throat> adult teacher's yeah. guide for our daily study well, guide. Here they've said, okay, the reason we say that, the evidence they give right here is that, well, there's no temple functioning anymore according to God's decree, so it can't be the temple on earth, so it must be the temple in heaven. If you remember what we studied last week, it compares Daniel 8 to Daniel 7, and there, it, it's the, the heavenly court scene takes place in heaven. So if these two are somehow linked, which we believe they are, then that's the other way. So, seventh, because 457 B.C. also is the starting point of the 2200 evenings and mornings, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary announced in Daniel 8, 13 and 14 must have begun in 1844. And that year, Christ entered the most holy place in order to carry out the investigative judgment. Eighth, I, think that, I guess I'm going to do that. Eighth, amid the complexity of the prophetic figures and other details, th let us not lose sight of Jesus. The events described in the prophecy culminate in the atoning work of the Messiah and indeed would benefit not only Israel but also the whole world. So Daniel received much more than he asked for. How often God does the same for us. He can answer our prayers in ways that exceed our expectations. Well, I hope you've beginning to see a picture here, and I hope you have a chance to go back over this material so you can nail it down in your mind. All these biblical time prophecies are now in the past from our perspective. We can spell them out in detail. Daniel waited 10 years to get the answers we have studied in this lesson. How patient are we in waiting for the second coming? How vigorously are we working to intercede for God's people in our day and especially for the very important reputation of God. Have you prayed for the reputation of God recently? Is that something that we should be praying for? Our kind and wonderful Father, we need to learn how to pray for your reputation. We need to learn how to speak about you in respectful ways that impress others that they need to know more about you. So many times in ancient history, some of your favorite friends, Moses and Hezekiah and now in Daniel we're talking about, stood up very, very clearly for your reputation. Give us the courage to do the same as our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen.